Well, good evening and welcome to this CPD Me webinar. Uh, my name is Andrew Umrod and I'll be facilitating tonight's webinar and I will very shortly be handing you over to Professor Matthew Reed talking all things aortic dissection. Uh, quoted one not to miss. So um, I can see there is lots of people jobbing in online now, as you do. So good evening from Team CPD Me. Uh, I'm here. I've got some team in the other room doing all things social media and magic. Uh, and uh, welcome to this wet and windy Tuesday night. Well, it's certainly wet and windy where we're broadcasting from. I'm not sure where you are, uh, but we've got an absolute excellent webinar prepared for you this evening. So just all we need you to do is basically make yourself a brew or a cup of tea, or a glass of water, maybe a glass of wine, sit back and enjoy this amazing informal learning. Uh, in the chat, I can see already that we've got Helen who said hello. Kethel is good evening. Uh, Jessica, hello. Uh, hi, Paul Seymour, who's a nurse. Evening, Paul. Always good to pop in the chat where you are uh, dialing in from. Uh, Keith from a wet list. <laughs> uh, yes, Keith, it's miserably wet and cold up here too. So always good if you can pop in the chat, uh, maybe what you do for a living, where you're dialing in. Uh, Danielle is a student, uh, paramedic from Scotland. Uh, good evening, Danielle. Uh, Phoebe, who's from London, I think. Well, that was supposed to be moving very fast. I can't see it now. Uh, Claire from Portsmouth. Uh, Andy, who's a critical care paramedic from Montana, USA. Uh, good evening to have you on board. Um, I was over in the EMS world recently with um, Dr. Linda Dykes and uh, met lots of uh, critical care paramedics. Um, sorry, Irish paramedic, it's all right. I'll excuse you, uh, Kethel. I hope I'm producing your name right, by the way. Um, we've got Alex, who's a NQP newly qualified paramedic from EMAS. Great to have you on board. Uh, I love it to pop in the chat where you come from. I probably could have been a social worker in my previous life rather than a paramedic because I just like to be nosy, I think. So I like to see where people are dialing in from. Uh, no offense to social workers out there. I can say that because my other half's a social worker and equally as nosy as I am. So um, if you are new to webinars, then you can probably just close off from here. But if you are uh, sat there in your satin embossed robe uh, or your matching gym jams with your partner, wife, husband, uh, or other half, or maybe half naked slumped on the settee, then don't worry because we can't see you. Uh, or maybe you're just sat there looking absolutely exhausted because you've just finished an absolute run of shifts and perhaps having a glass of wine. Don't worry, I'm not here to judge you, uh, we, but we can't see you and we can't hear you. But if you have any questions for Professor Matthew, then please pop them into the questions and answer box and then we'll answer them or as many of them as we can at the end. And of course, if you are a premium member of CPDME, then you will get the certificate and the evidence and such that will drop into your portfolio. And I'll show you how that works in a second. And of course, you'll get access to the recording on your CPD dashboard that will be all nicely polished tomorrow by Team Fabio, Team Amy and Team Jessica. Uh, if you are going to get social with us, then do please tag us in on social media. Uh, it's always good. You've probably seen this week that we've uh, give away, I think, about 100 cups. So uh, please do tag us in with hashtag CPD Made Simple. Take us a selfie. Maybe you sat there uh, with a big screen on. I realize that you can download our CPD Me app and then live stream it to a big TV. So it looks like a, almost like a CPD Netflix. I think I'm allowed to say that without a legal battle. But it allows you to do it and put it on a big screen because I've seen a few this week. Uh, so as you always know, uh, if we do tag you and like you on uh, social media, then we will send you one of our CPDME cups. And the good thing about these cups is when you scan the QR code on the front, it goes through to all of the amazing free up and coming webinars. So please do tag us in on social media. Uh, seven good reasons to become a CPDME member. If you're anything like me, I struggled to capture and record my CPD and what we created back in 2009 was an absolutely amazing way for you to capture and record your CPD. Even more easier when, in fact, you use our mobile app, because just like tonight, once you've attended the webinar, the mobile app will receive a copy of the certificate, a copy of the log, the title, the date, and all the information around tonight's webinar that just literally leaves you to go in and reflect around it. So all you need to do is once you get notification on the app or your email, click into edit, and then all you need to do is reflect around your learning from tonight's experience. And it makes capturing and recording CPD simple. So it puts the evidence there, it puts your certificate there. Then all you need to do ultimately is dictate into the app what have you done, why have you done it, and how might that influence or change your practice. But more importantly, how will that support the patients or the way that you do your job for the future? So it really does make recording CPD super simple. And of course, for the premium package, it's £17.99 per year. I honestly don't know how we do it because that includes 
access to over 400 recorded webinars with automatic certificates, along with 80 live webinars per year for £17.99. And we often get lots of people saying, is this monthly? Definitely not. It's per year. And of course, for access to that, you get all the goodies that I showed you previously. Plus, if you go into absolute meltdown mode because you've been picked for the amazing audit, then you can ring one of the team up and they will literally walk you through the audit process and show you how you can get your portfolio prepared for submission. So there is a free version. You can download the app and try the free version, but I would strongly recommend the upgrade because you get lots of goodies. And even more so if you are a student, because we've just received funding for 100,000 students across the footprint of Scotland, England, Ireland, and Wales. So now is a good chance to get your camera out, take a picture of that screen and share that with anybody you know who is a student, because as long as they've got a student ac.uk or IE, or any prefix, as long as it's a student email address, they will get free CPDME access for their duration of their studies. So please do share that with friends and colleagues. But this week we've had, I think, 185 new students join, so one definitely not to miss. Now, you probably all know that we don't spend any money on advertising here at CPDME. We spend the money from your memberships back on bringing you live presenters and amazing speakers like Professor Matthew tonight. So, but we do rely on some genuine reviews on Trustpilot, Google, Google reviews and such. So please do leave us some genuine reviews because it's really, really important that that supports our business moving forward. Okay. Are you sitting comfortable? Well, I know quite a few people are because I can still see there's a lot of people. Erica, I see you nurse from New Zealand. Evening, Erica. I, gosh, I wish I was in New Zealand. I bet, I bet the weather's nicer there than it is here in miserable Manchester. Uh, and we've got also uh, Lily, who is a final year medical student from Romania. Uh, great to have you on board. Uh, Lisa, who's a medical editor and dissection survivor from Harrogate. Uh, evening. Great to have you on board, Lisa. Fabulous. So are you there, Professor Matthew? Hi, yes, I'm here. Thank you I'm very gonna much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Let me click this magic button. There we go. The arena is all yours. Right. So can you see that first slide? Um, I don't think it's loaded up just yet. One second. You might just need to click the share screen option again at the bottom. Okay, let me do that again. Uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Good. Great. So thank you so much for that introduction and uh, for the uh, opportunity to speak to you all uh, this evening. Uh, such a, a, a huge range of people from from all over the world and from such different backgrounds. So um, delighted to be able to speak to you. Um, there are my details there. That's my 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 Twitter link. Uh, it looks like from the introduction, I need to get a bit more up to date down with the kids and get my TikTok link as well. Um, but uh, that's some details. So yeah, I'm, so I'm Matt Reed, and a little bit of background about me. So this is why I work. I work in Edinburgh. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, a bit cold, wet, and windy tonight, as I'm sure all of you are as well. Um, I, as you uh, you realise, are not Scottish. I came up here about twenty years ago and haven't left since. Um, it's a, a great place to visit if you haven't already. This is why I work and this is important just for a little bit of background when I talk about some of the epidemiology of uh, acute aortic dissection. We see about 120,000 patients a year in our emergency department in Edinburgh. We're a, a major trauma unit. We see uh, hyperacute stroke. Uh, we do stroke thrombolysis and um, we uh, an intervention and also uh, uh, see all the primaries for cardiac angioplasty. Uh, so we're a busy unit. There's one other emergency department on the outskirts of Edinburgh, but essentially there's just the two departments in the whole of Edinburgh. I do a large amount of clinical work, but also I'm lucky enough to have two days a week uh, where I do academic research time. And this is our research group in Edinburgh. Um, a big group, we are one of the leading recruiters to emergency medicine trials and uh, have one of the largest portfolios of emergency uh, medicine studies in the UK. Um, so that's a little bit of background about me and where I work. Tonight, I was going to cover the following five uh, uh, topics. So first of all, I'm going to talk about epidemiology of acute aortic dissection. Who does it happen to? Uh, what are the demographics? Then we're going to go and talk about some pathophysiology, 
what is it about what actually happens in this condition and to clear up a couple of confusions around it as well i'm going to talk about the symptoms so really important what do we need to look out for if uh, we're considering someone might have an acute aortic dissection and also uh, when should we consider it and we don't consider it enough um, and that leads me on to diagnosis and why we miss it and uh, i'm going to finish up with a little bit about how can we actually improve how we do here um, and we're going to talk about some other strategies that uh, we may are available to us to help us think about it and help us to uh, to diagnose it and uh, things that might improve in the future. So I'd like to start by telling a story. This uh, is the uh, the case of Mr. S, who was a patient I saw in our emergency department about six years ago. And I was working in our rapid access uh, assessment triage area where we just sort of eyeball patients and um, uh, try and uh, get treatments or, or investigations ordered early as, as many of uh, emergency departments across the UK have. And I saw Mr S who presented with a cold white arm. It was uh, uh, his left arm uh, and it had been present for about six hours. Um, no other presenting symptoms, and I did actually consider acute aortic dissection, but it looked very much like a fairly straightforward case of an acute embolic event causing an acute limb ischemia in his arm. He went through to our main bit of department, and I handed him over to the consultant uh, in that part of the department who saw him and agreed that uh, there wasn't anything else to consider or to suggest aortic dissection, we phoned the vascular team and he went to, uh, to theatre later that afternoon where he had a brachial artery thrombus removed, went back to the ward and I'm very tragically at 3 a.m. Uh, that evening I had a cardiac arrest on the ward. Now his um, post-mortem showed that he had uh, an, a type, type A acute aortic dissection. And going back through the story, it turns out a few weeks before he had presented to our acute medical team with uh, some fairly, from the notes sounding, benign sounding chest pain. He was worked up as an acute coronary syndrome and was discharged uh, with a negative troponin. And whether this was the point at which his dissection occurred, we don't know. Um, but uh, clearly uh, that, that information may have made a difference, it may have not. So that's a bit of a personal experience. Um, now I'm certainly not alone having misdiagnosed a case of aortic dissection. This is some data from the last 10 years in uh, our two Edinburgh hospitals. Um, and there are 26 patients that uh, we have not initially made the diagnosis for acute aortic dissection. But it's not only us. So about one in three of patients are misdiagnosed who have aortic dissection and a quarter of patients are not diagnosed until at least 24 hours after they presented to the emergency department. I'll touch a bit later about the negligence claims associated with it uh, in a recent report this year. Um, and the tragic thing is we know that the prognosis is best when patients are treated early. So for every hour of delay in making the diagnosis from when the dissections occurs, mortality increases by 2%. But if we do diagnose it and we treat it early, 80% of patients will survive if they've reached hospital. So a bit of background, there are 4,000 patients a year in the UK who have acute aortic dissection. Most commonly are the type ones, and I'll talk about what a type one aortic dissection is. About half of these patients die before they reach hospital. So these would be patients who have cardiac arrest. Some of them may just die at home um, and some may have cardiac arrest but about 50% of them um, come into hospital. Now, I was always taught as a medical student that there were, there were two clear uh, peaks in the age incidence of acute aortic dissection, one earlier on and one much later. And the one much later in the older age group uh, was, was larger than the earlier one. Now, this graph doesn't reflect this quite as much, but uh, it does show the, uh, the age groups associated with aortic dissection um, but it still is really important to note that this is condition that also affects young people. So 25% of patients will age less than 50, half of them will age less than 60. 
So this is not only a condition that affects elderly people, it's unlike aortic aneurysms, which we'll, we'll talk about as well afterwards, which I have never seen in anyone less than 60. Um, aortic dissection can affect any age group, and that's because uh, the older age group affected because of atherosclerosis, and the younger age group affected because of connective tissue disease that can cause dissection. So don't use age as a reason and to not consider it. Now you might say, well, it's, it's really rare. I'm just not gonna see a case of aortic dissection, am I? And it, it may not be as common as some other conditions such as MI, but it is still not uncommon. 4,000 cases a year. I'm sure all of you who have worked in the emergency department will have uh, diagnosed someone with a new diagnosis of a, a brain tumor on a CT scan with symptoms, about 50% of uh, brain cancers are diagnosed in the emergency department um, and it's as common as that and this is the number of cases we've had uh, all together over the last few years in Lothian which is our two emergency departments so we see between about 15 and 20 cases a year so most uh, of our ED clinicians will see at least one case a year um, generally so you will see a reasonably number of these over your career. Another uh, statistic to put the condition into perspective, uh, two and a half thousand patients die within a month of being diagnosed with acute aortic dissection. And that's very similar to the number that die or more from road traffic accidents and from PE. So it is a, a, a large cause of mortality. And that does put it into perspective when you think about the amount of um, uh, infrastructure we have for managing trauma with major trauma centers and everything that goes on in the pre-hospital environment through to uh, the systems we have in place in hospitals to manage patients coming with trauma yet more people die of acute uh, aortic dissection and cases are going to rise so because we're uh, we're having a, a generally a, an older age group um, and it it is uh, more predominant in the sort of the 40 to 60, 70 year olds, um, it does mean that cases will rise over the next 10 years. And we, we expect cases to rise up to about 6,000 in the next 10 years and ongoing. So it's, it's not something that's going away. So that's a bit about epidemiology. Now I'm gonna talk about some pathophysiology. So first of all, we're gonna talk about the anatomy of the aorta. Now the aorta starts at just, uh, at the aortic root, which uh, the aortic valve obviously um, uh, is the outflow tract to the left ventricle, which then has the aortic root, which is where your coronary arteries come off. And then you have the ascending thoracic aorta, which uh, goes up to the, uh, the, um, the arch here. And there are three main vessels that come off the arch. There's the right subclavian, the right common carotid, and the, um, uh, the uh, sorry, the, um, the combined um, right subclavian and right common carotid, which is the uh, brachycephalic artery. There's the left common carotid and the left subclavian. And this is important when we uh, talk about the type of dissection, whether it's a type A or a type B, and that is important because it influences the management that's occur that occurs. Now, the cutoff point is here, uh, just after the left subclavian artery. And anything that affects the ascending, uh, the root and the arch uh, is classed as a type A aortic dissection. And anything that starts from after the left subclavian artery is a type B. If it involves both, it's a type A. So that's the anatomy. This is a cross section of the aorta. Uh, so this is the root, this is the ascending arch coming up here, and this is your right brachiocephalic. And if we take a cross sectional cut through the aorta, we see that there are three main layers. There's the intima, the media, which is uh, a reasonably large layer compared to the others made up of lots of connective tissue, and the outer adventitia layer. And this is really important when we, when we go on to talk about what is the pathology that's happening here? And what happens essentially is that you get a small tear in the intima, so the inner lining of the aorta. 
And that small tear allows blood to go into this middle media area. And because the media is weaker than the other two walls, the blood, which is under pressure, because it's coming straight out of the heart um, under pressure, will then track up and down through the media, uh, separating the layers of the intima and the adventitia. And it will just track all the way along. So the, the blood will just track all the way along. So this is what happens. You get a little tear here. The blood goes in and then it separates the two, the inner and the outer layer of the aortic wall. And the blood tracks through this uh, new lumen created with an aorta, which is referred to as the false lumen. And when we would uh, refer to acute aortic syndrome, we're talking about four different conditions. We're talking about acute aortic dissection, type A and type B. So that's two of the conditions that make up aortic syndrome. There's an intramural hematoma, which is due to bleeding within the media with no obvious tear in the intima. And this is thought to be to, um, to, due to lower pressure bleeding within the, the media. And there's also a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. So what happens here is that the, uh, the blood uh, tracks into the media, but because of atherosclerosis, it does limit the amount of tracking uh, proximally and uh, distally, so up and down the aorta. So you get a small area where you get ulceration, but you don't get tracking of the blood up and down because of this extensive atherosclerosis. But by far the commonest type is the type A aortic dissection. Now this is a CT scan showing a cross section of a aorta and you can see this is called the uh, dissection flap here and there's the false lumen and the true lumen. Now aortic dissection acutely is a dynamic process so the caliber of the true and the false lumen is very dependent on the pressure in between in both of those lumens and that will determine whether the flap moves more towards the true lumen or to the false lumen. So what happens when the dissecting process happens, the blood moves into the false lumen and then a few things happen. Either the blood can rupture the aorta so it goes out of the outer layer, the, ad, uh, the adventitia, rupturing out into the chest cavity and that is normally a fatal condition. What might happen is the blood might track back into the proper aorta and create another tear where the blood goes back in and creates a, what we call a double lumen channel. So uh, the blood can go either through both lumens arriving back distally into the normal aorta. You might get a branch vessel occlusion, which I'll talk about. This is can be complicated to understand what's going on here, but I've got a few diagrams to show you, but essentially, the false lumen where uh, has blood within it and where branches come off the aorta, the, the true lumen, the false lumen surrounds them. And if you have high enough pressure in the false lumen, it collapses the true lumen and doesn't allow any um, perfusion of any of the vessels coming off the aorta. And as I'll go on to say, this explains why you can have bizarre symptoms like stroke. So it might occlude the left carotid artery, for example, you might find that there's a STEMI presentation and that's because the branch to the left core artery is occluded. You might find that there's um, what looks like a, a left, or in the case of the patient I saw, a, a left arm uh, um, ischemia because uh, the subclavian artery has been occluded and it's dynamic. So as the pressure changes between the true and the false lumens, you can reperfuse parts of the body again. So you may have somebody present with stroke symptoms that then settle, and then they have an ST elevation on their, on their ECG, which then changes, and then they might have stroke symptoms again. And that's why this can happen. Now, this pressure can stabilize over minutes, hours, at the most a few days. So that pattern can change, but does stabilize after a while, and you can get a chronic picture. Now, I said, if the blood ruptures out of the false lumen uh, into the chest cavity, you either get a big 
mediastinal hematoma, a hemothorax, or big pericardial effusion, which will lead to tamponade and is fatal. And we think about 7% of out of hospital cardiac arrest are due to type A aortic dissection and, and are unsurvivable. Now, this is the branch vessel occlusion. So what happens here, as I was explaining, is the true lumen, you have a vessel coming off of it here, but the false lumen, if you imagine this is in cross section, is surrounding the true lumen. And as the pressure goes up in the false lumen, it, it blocks off this vessel here. So you don't get perfusion to this organ. You can also have the case where the false lumen has so much pressure in it, it completely occludes the true lumen. So this is the false lumen here. And this is the true lumen. So you get very poor perfusion distally down to the lower limbs. I've mentioned classification. There are two classifications. The main one that's of any use is the Stanford one where we divide it into type A and type B. Type A is proximal and type B is distal. And the reason we use this one um, is that it, it mandates what treatment's required. So a type A aortic dissection is a surgically managed um, management with cardiothoracic surgeons replacing the arch of the aorta. With type B, it's a medically managed where we lower the blood pressure to allow the dissection to become chronic and to settle down. Um, and that's managed by medical teams, normally cardiology in a CCU environment. Now, I wanted to touch on this um, to distinguish the difference between an aortic dissection and an aortic aneurysm. They're very different pathologies. They present in very different ways. The treatment's very different as well. And it is very easy to confuse the two. And commonly, when you're working in the emergency department, um, you're, you're here, uh, uh, medical and nursing staff, um, talking about doing bilateral blood pressures in both arms to see there's a, if there's a difference. And the reason we do that is because possibly if there is a dissection and you have, as I said, knocked off the true lumen to one arm, but not to the other, you'll get a different blood pressure or you might not get a pulse in one arm, but you may in the other. Now, this is specific to aortic dissection. Aortic aneurysm can affect the thoracic cavity, but more commonly the abdominal cavity where we get an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And this is something, is a slow ballooning of the aorta that happens over years. And slowly this, uh, a, the aneurysm enlarges and enlarges. And when we get to about five or six centimeters of the risk of it rupturing, it ruptures and you either get free blood into the abdomen or tracking into the retroperitoneal space. So it's a complete rupture of the aorta. This is very different to a dissection, which is where you get this tear in the inner wall of the aorta, causing blood to track between the layers of the aorta. Pa patients who have an acute aortic dissection, although they may not have a normal uh, aorta pathologically, may have a totally normal looking aorta to the, the eye, uh, to the naked eye, whereas with patients with an abdominal aneurysm, you'll see the moment before it ruptures will have a large ballooning of the aorta. Now, these are two different conditions. Um, a abdominal uh, aneurysm presents with a sudden onset of back or abdominal pain with collapse and the very hypotensive patient due to sudden onset of hemorrhagic shock. Aortic dissection presents in a different way, which we'll go into. So let's talk about the symptoms. So the symptoms can be due to three main different parts of the pathology. So first of all, the dissection of the aortic wall is extremely painful. So it's a sudden thing. It happens in seconds. The, the tear, the blood gets into the tear and into the, uh, the, the wall, uh, the middle wall of the aorta and tracks up and down, peeling away the aorta, which is intensely painful. Now this happens uh, immediately, so the pain is sudden, it's intense, um, it might settle, and that's when the dissectin process stops, the pain may settle, but the actual event of the dissection is painful. We may have a contained rupture, so I've talked about uh, what uh, that might entail, where the, the aorta itself ruptures, 
Um, you may have a big hemothorax causing symptoms. And there's also the symptoms of malperfusion. So with the, the dissection itself, we've talked about there being intense pain. We've talked about the fact that it might improve. And some people say it's described as a ripping pain or tearing pain, but this isn't particularly accurate. If there's a contained rupture, the patient's severely unwell with blood in their chest, around the heart, with effusion or um, a, a pericardial effusion. And um, they, they tend to be very unwell with breathlessness and hypotension. Or they may present with symptoms of malperfusion, and this is where the dissection process has taken off some vessels coming off the aorta. Um, now, as I said, this may be transient because it does depend on the differential flow between the false and the true lumen, and it can, can change. And as I said, if, it, if you'll remember my uh, initial uh, uh, diagram of the aorta coming out of the heart, just at the level of the aortic valve, the coronary arteries come off just after that. So if you get dissection goes all the way back to the aortic root, you can lose the right or the left coronary artery, giving you a STEMI mimic. We've talked about the carotids causing a, a CVA mimic. You may knock off vessel, your um, mesenteric arteries causing ischemic colitis symptoms predominantly. You may have ischemic limbs and you may have uh, a number of these, none of them, or, or one specific thing. So we know what it is. Uh, we know the pathology. So uh, why is it so difficult to make the diagnosis? Well, one of the reasons is the commonest symptom of aortic section is pain. And that is also one of the commonest symptoms of um, uh, conditions that patients present to the emergency department with. Patients can present with back and abdominal pain, but again, these are common presentations. And there are 2 million presentations a year to EDs with chest, back and abdominal pain. Now with chest pain, atraumatic chest pain, uh, only one in a thousand patients who have atraumatic chest pain will have aortic dissection or uh, an acute aortic syndrome, which is uh, what I refer to this, this uh, group of conditions. Um, of aortic dissection, AAS, but only one in a thousand will have that. And 999 patients, 979, um, will have other causes that are not aortic dissection. And this is important when we think about well, how we're going to diagnose it, because clearly we can't do, we can't CT scan everybody who has chest pain. So this is um, uh, a chart of all the major presentations we had to our uh, ED last year, as you can see, chest pain is the commonest cause for presentation to the majors part of our department. And the problem with aortic dissection, it's an uh, absolutely classic problem of a low signal, high noise ratio. So the, the weak signal of the aortic dissection is overwhelmed by the background noise of all the patients that we have presenting with complaints that could but do not represent acute aortic dissection. So out of all of the patients we have chest pain, back pain, abdominal pain, um, there's lots of them. There's a, such a small number that have aortic dissection and not all of them come in saying, hey, I've got an aortic dissection. I've got the most severest pain. I look absolutely awful. I've got very low blood pressure. I've got a pericardial tamponade um, and uh, um, I've got Marfan syndrome. <laughs> that doesn't happen. So. The, the signal is very weak against a huge backlog of patients who potentially could have aortic dissection. And research hasn't got particularly far with the diagnosis of this so far. We're good at treating it. And the reason for that is it's, it's a relatively rare disease, uh, a, a relatively when we're looking at uh, emergency department conditions generally. One of the reasons which I'll touch on is why it's missed is because we don't always think about it. And if we don't think about it, how can we enroll someone into a study looking at it? Because we haven't thought about it. It has multiple presenting complaints, as I've said. It's not just chest pain, it can present in other ways. Um, if we can send people to studies and trials, then the problem is lots of these patients are unwell, so you won't be able to recruit them. There's something called the Hawthorne effect, which means when you start looking at condition, uh, you say, right, today we're going to study aortic dissection. You'll find that everyone in the department that day has aortic dissection on their mind and thinks of it in every patient that they see. 
And that's the problem with telling people that you're going to do research on it. I'll touch on D-dimers and CT scans a bit later on, but it's not a test that we do in everybody. So it's not as if we can do some observational work looking at how many patients come in with these things and, and what how these things can help us, because we tend to only do them on patients when we're trying to rule out a certain condition. Now, we teamed up with uh, Freemly Health uh, to uh, add to our data that we'd started to collect for the missed cases we had over the last 10 years to try and better understand why we miss acute ALT dissection. So we looked at m, &M records, complaints, post-mortem reports, and we looked also at everyone who'd had a CT in the hospital downstream from the ED who had, had an aortic section picked up that we tracked back to the emergency department that we realized that we'd missed coming through us. We found 43 cases over 10 years. They were most commonly type A, no surprise there. The presenting features, chest pain, chest pain, radiating to the back, back pain, no particular surprises there. We looked at what alternative diagnoses were made in these patients. And here we start to get a little bit into why we do miss aortic uh, section. So a third of these patients were thought to have acute coronary syndrome and uh, diagnosed with that. There were 12% that were thought to have PE. There were 5% who were thought to have stroke. And there's some other uh, symptoms, other conditions there, renal colic, soft gel spasm, that can are well-known mimics of aortic section. And why did we miss it? So in three quarters of these patients, when we look back all of them through the notes, there wasn't really much evidence that we'd actually considered aortic dissection as a differential. Once you consider it, it's very difficult really to rule it out, um, but we just hadn't considered it. So there needs to be more awareness of the condition to be able to think of it in patients who potentially might have it. And about half of patients, we decided there was an alternative diagnosis and we're happy with that. And we thought, yep, yeah, it is acute coma syndrome. I'm going to go down that treatment line. Um, or that we excluded acute coma syndrome with the normal troponin, and we're happy with that as well and, and let the patient away home. A couple of other reasons. One was that we had a normal chest X-ray and therefore ruled out aortic dissection which we cannot do, and I'll, which I'll come on to talk about. And also that we considered it, but the patient didn't have any of those classic signs. So they didn't have a pulse deficit in both arms. So one arm having a pulse, the other one not. They didn't have a different blood pressure in their left and their right arm. They didn't have the classic um, murmur of aortic regurgitation where the blood has tracked around the aortic valve and has made it incompetent. So they didn't have that. So we thought, no, they don't have dissection. Surprisingly, those patients, all the patients we missed out, those 43, 14 died, which, uh, which is higher than the 80% survival rate if we make the diagnosis, um, but maybe not as, not as, uh, as poor um, as we were expecting, given that we, all of these patients had a delayed diagnosis. So in summary, we decided we, we showed that there was definitely a lack of considering the diagnosis, which probably comes through a lack of awareness. Um, to, some cases were atypical, but not always. We're particularly um, noticeable about how many patients had written in their notes, sudden onset, severe chest pain, and then it wasn't considered. Um, mimicking other disease, acute coma syndrome, PE being the two common ones, and reassurance because they didn't have any typical clinical signs. Now, there's been uh, another piece of work that has looked at factors that have caused clinicians to miss out its section. And uh, Lovat uh, last year, a couple of years ago now, uh, showed that uh, those factors were, again, a normal chest X-ray was used to rule it out and you can't do that. The patient has symptoms of other conditions. So example, this suggest, was suggestive of a PE or acute coma syndrome. But the patient walked in. So we think of acute aortic dissection as, as it is a severe, severe disease. Uh, we expect patients to be really unwell and a lot of the time they are. But if they've had the dissection and it's settled, 
they don't have the pain from that they may well walk in so we can't exclude it in someone who's just walked in again this is one of the reasons it's so difficult and similarly to us the absence of typical symptoms and i've touched on some of these typical symptoms uh, now whilst tearing ripping description of the pain is suggested by some patients if the patient doesn't have it you can't rule it out not all patients have a tearing or ripping pain and we've talked about a differential blood pressure not having that doesn't exclude it not having a pulse deficit doesn't exclude it patients can be acutely hypertensive but again if you're not it doesn't exclude it and i'm just going to let you indulge me for a minute here and uh, give you a bit of some numbers for this so let us think about those four, four uh, typical uh, symptoms. Now, there's something called negative likelihood ratios. You don't need to know what it is, but essentially it gives you a value between 0 and 1 that if you put a, a percentage on the likelihood of you, someone having a condition, and then you do a test or you look for something or a feature, if you apply that to your patient, does that make any difference to the likelihood that they have the condition? So let's say I've got someone in front of me in the resource room. I think there's a 50% chance of them having aortic dissection. If I don't have, for example, a, a differential in their blood pressures, um, and uh, when we look at research, we find that the likelihood ratio there is 0.5. It only reduces that chance of about 15%. If it's one, it rules it out. If it's naught, it doesn't make any difference at all. So let's have a look at that for these typical symptoms. So if you have a, if you don't have tearing or ripping pain, you don't have differential blood pressures, you don't have pulse deficit, or you don't, you're not acutely hypertensive, the negative light ratio is almost one, which means that if you thought they had a 50% chance of it before, they don't have any of those things they've got about a 45% chance still of having aortic dissection. So looking for these features and ruling it out because the patient doesn't have them really doesn't make any difference to the likelihood of them having aortic dissection. What about an abnormal chest X-ray or a wide median steinum? Well, here it's pretty much no better than tossing a coin. 22% of patients with aortic dissection have a totally normal chest X-ray. So if we do find a totally normal chest x-ray, the negative life likelihood ratio is only 0.5, which means you're only reducing the chance of them having an aortic sex by 10%. So if I thought there was a 50% chance of it before, and they've got a totally normal chest x-ray, they've still got a 40% chance of having aortic dissection, which is still significant. So we can't rule out aortic dissection on the basis of a normal chest x-ray. So what is helpful? Well, abrupt onset pain, so sudden onset pain, has an excellent negative likelihood ratio. So it reduces the chances if a patient doesn't have abrupt onset pain, it halves the likelihood that this patient in front of you has aortic dissection. It still doesn't rule it out, but it makes it much less likely. So this is a symptom we need to look for. And if someone has abrupt onset pain, we clearly need to be investigating uh, further. Worst ever pain, again, is really common. So this is this is the subarachnoid hemorrhage of headache. Sudden onset, severest pain with chest pain is aortic dissection until proven otherwise. Same as sudden onset of headache is subarachnoid hemorrhage until proven otherwise. I touched on negligence reports, and uh, this was released last year looking at negligence claims uh, in EDs. And I'm just going to read this out because uh, it's very telling. It says the most common causes of death uh, in these negligent claims were misdiagnosed uh, infection, PE, uh, acute coma syndrome, and aortic disease, including dissection. And they say they identified poor awareness and recognition of the significance of the presenting symptoms, along with evidence of lost opportunities to use information from the ambulance and triage notes. And I think you could probably put that to missing most conditions. The important thing for me is the use of the ambulance and the triage notes. The paramedics will write really helpful, useful information in the notes that may be lost in handover. And you have to read the ambulance notes for every patient you see. Um, the patient you're seeing uh, sometimes at the moment, many hours after they actually were uh, 
had their initial symptoms and the patient sitting in front of you with no chest pain looking absolutely fine is very different from the patients that the paramedics saw in their house moments after they had their sudden onset of chest pain. So this is really important and something I think worth taking away. So I painted a fairly bleak picture there of how we do uh, with managing uh, and diagnosing acute LT sections. So how can we do better? Now there's campaigns out there, the LTIC section charitable trust um, does a huge amount of education and we've got some great resources online. There's a campaign by another group called the uh, Think Aorta uh, campaign uh, to try and encourage awareness. However, over the last 10 years, since uh, uh, certainly the Think Aorta campaign has been around, we've noticed no difference in improvement in mortality or by detecting aortic dissection. So awareness is extremely important and it is important that we have campaigns like Think Aorta to try and remember to think about it, but it's not the only answer. We did a clinician survey of practice across the UK with 56 EDs responding, and we showed that only 12% of EDs have a formal pathway for working up patients with potentially acute LT section, and most were not really using any particular guidelines. The Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines were used in a few departments, and the aortic dissection detection risk score was being used in about 20%. Now, the reason probably that so many few guidelines are used is that there really isn't anything that is particularly good, straightforward, simple to use, that gives us a good method of ruling in or ruling out acute aortic dissection. Now, this is the problem. If we think someone might have an acute aortic dissection, the, the diagnosis uh, the, or the investigation to make the diagnosis is a CT scan. Now, we can't CT scan everybody who has acute chest pain because if we do that at the moment, uh, the yield of uh, picking up acute aortic section on CT is about 2%. And that, that might be fine because it's such a serious condition. But if we start getting into lower numbers than that, we're doing far too many CTs, which will have cost implications. We're exposing people to radiation. Some of these patients will be young or have cancer risks going on. We're uh, making the queue for other conditions we need to diagnose worse. So there'll be delays for our head injury patients, our trauma patients. And anyone who's had to go through a, a day's worth of ED re results will know about incidental omas where we find abnormal chest x-rays requiring repeating, bringing patients back and things. So, and this will just get worse if we CT everybody. In our practice, we're seating about 5%. This is pretty much probably the UK national average. It's around about four to 5% of CTs of positive for ELTA. I think if it's higher than that, we're probably not doing enough CTs. I'm just going to finish by talking about something called uh, the ADDRS score, which is uh, something that I said about one in five departments use in their guidelines. And this is uh, one of the, the clinical decision tools to help us. The other one is the AORTA score. And essentially, uh, this is to decide who should get a CT once we've considered they might be potential. Uh, the AORTA section is something we need to think about. So there's three categories. We need to ask whether the patient has any predisposing conditions. Do they have any pain characteristics that are suggestive of it? And do they have any physical examination findings? So if they have any of the things in the first column, they score a point, but only one point. If they've got all five, they still only get one point. They score any of the things in the second column, the middle column, they get a point. And if they have any of the things in the third column, they get a point as well. So they can either have a score of naught when they've got none of those or three if they've got something in all three columns. Now, how can we use that to decide whether to do a CT or not? And obviously the gold standard is a CT uh, aortic angiogram, which makes the diagnosis if we do it. When this meta-analysis, the score itself, if we, anyone who's got a score of one or more, so one, two, or three, we CT scan, but we don't scan someone with a score of naught, we'll miss one in 17 patients with aortic dissection. That's clearly not acceptable. What if we scan everyone with a score of two or three, we'll miss half of them. So again, this score in itself isn't useful. What about D-dimer? There's a lot of interest in using D-dimer now to rule out aortic dissection. Can we do it? Well, 
if we just use D-dimer on its own, nothing else, a raised D-dimer, and that might be 250 or 500, depending what your lab cutoff is for PE. So same cutoff for your, uh, that you use for PE in your hospital. If we just use D-dimer alone, so if you've got a normal D-dimer, you don't CT, and we see, if they get a raised D-dimer, we CT them, we'll miss one in 25. So it's starting to get a bit better. What about if we combine the two? What if we say D-dimer and ADDRS? So if you've got a score of one, two, or three, or a raised D-dimer, we're starting to get a little bit better here. So the sensitivity is excellent. So we won't miss many cases. We only miss one in 500, but there's an awful specificity, which means we'll still be scanning a huge number of patients with all the relative risks of future cancer and things. What if we say you've got a score of two or three, or you have a raised D-dimer? This is getting a bit more like it. So we'll miss one in 167 patients that come to us for aortic dissection, um, which, which is pretty good uh, compared to all other conditions. We accept 2% miss rate in acute MI and subarachnoid hemorrhage. And the specificity, this is about how many patients we're scanning, is actually much better. So there's certainly some suggestion that using a ADDRS plus D-dimer um, may be a safe option. However, it hasn't been looked at in the UK, and a lot of these studies were done in acute uh, settings, which were, say, cardiothoracic centres or where, you know, you take everybody with chest pain, chest pain units, so not all comers like we have in the UK EDs. So I said there are a few other clinical precision rules, all the same, they lead to high rates of CT and have a lower diagnostic yield. We're leading a study at the moment, the DASH study, which some of you may have been involved with, which has uh, taken data over the last uh, few months from 27 hospitals, recruiting almost 6,000 patients um, to see uh, if we can collect some data on how clinicians manage patients with aortic dissection. So hopefully over the next few years, we'll be able to develop this into a strategy to manage patients in the ED. So to finish, um, a few take home messages. So first of all, out of section is rare, but it's not rare enough that we won't see it. And we'll probably, if we're working in the ED, probably see a case a year. It is devastating and it is often misdiagnosed and missed. But if we detect it in the ED, patients have a four, four or five of our patients will survive and go home. The clinical features are very unreliable, it presents with chest pain, abdominal back pain, stroke symptoms, uh, signs of ischemia. But the key things to take away home are that a sudden onset of severe pain is aortic dissection till proven otherwise. It's a dynamic process. So someone presents with stroke-like symptoms and chest pain or ECG changes with limb weakness. Again, that's pathognomonic for aortic dissection. They need a CT and symptoms may come and go. So a patient may be well now, but may have been very unwell when the pain came on, but now be, may be fine, the pain might have settled, and they may be hemodynamically normal. We need to improve education, so we need to be better at thinking who we should consider in, and we also need a better detection strategy. So once we've considered it, what do we do? Because at the moment, we consider it in far too many patients, and we have to decide ourselves who we should scan and who not, depending um, on our gestalt, really. And things like something like decision rule or biochemical markers might be able to help us with this process. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. And I think I've got a bit of time to take some questions. Matthew, perfectly timed indeed. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to let you have a drink and have a look at the Q&A box uh, and decide which questions we're going to be able to answer. Uh, I've just put a quick thank you in the chat to uh, Holly, Duarte, Claire, uh, for leaving tonight's feedback. I have just popped some links in the chat. Let me just pop them in again to make sure that they stay there currently. Oh, gosh, I do this all the time. I copy and paste it, and then I type something to somebody on Twitter, and then it just puts a random message. So um, I will put the link for Professor Matthew in the chat now. Um, because equally, as well as your CPD tonight, uh, Professor Matt can use your feedback for his own CPD. It's almost like a CPD roller coaster, isn't it? 
CPD for me, CPD for you, CPD for all of us. So um, please do leave us some genuine feedback. The links are in there. You will get the links tomorrow as well. I do think that they come by email. So um, if you don't get a chance to get them tonight, uh, they will come tomorrow. But um, please do leave us some genuine feedback. More importantly, talking the feedback around how the information from um, Professor Matt uh, might influence or change your practice, because then we know that the CPD circle uh, is complete. Uh, equally, I've put some links in the chat, so make sure you please do leave us some reviews. I already have seen some reviews come through, but I'm not very good at multitasking this time of night, so, uh, but we will acknowledge them. And again, uh, you will be in the chance to win two £25 vouchers tomorrow to spend on Amazon, so you can buy yourself maybe a book on clinical examination skills, clinical history taking, or something that floats your boat. And of course, we have got some webinars coming up. So please jump over to our website at cpdme.com slash webinars, where we've got a webinar tomorrow night on applying for a new job, uh, and then psychiatric medication, and then one later next week by Professor Simon Carley on paediatric trauma assessment. And I'm pretty confident that that webinar is booked up almost. So please don't delay in jumping over there. Then, of course, if you ever do miss our webinars or you're 10 minutes late or 20 minutes late, by virtue and nature of our audience, we know that you're often running home from work late. So a top tip for you is all of our webinars are live streamed for 24 hours after the live broadcast starts and they always start at eight o'clock but if you're ever half an hour late and you think oh gosh i've missed that webinar i wanted to catch up on it if you jump onto the youtube channel you can actually watch it back live from the beginning but then it's only on there for 24 hours so that's a really good tip for you the other good tip is we get around about 100 support tickets every single day asking where the links are if you register for a webinar and you don't get the registration link within 10 minutes it's likely your email has blocked it. So contact the support team. If you've got the app, you can even send them a WhatsApp message now. It's like really posh, this magic technology of how it all works. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go for some questions and answers. Let me see if I can get my mouse over onto the right screen and we'll um, get to the question and answer box. So are you good for some questions and answers? Professor Matt. Yeah, go for it. I see there's quite a few there. I think most can I can tackle fairly quickly. So uh, um, yeah, far away. Right. Let me just I just clicked on the box. It's just close it down. Oh gosh, why can't I see my mouse? Sure. I've got them here. Shall I start? You can do. Yeah. Well, I find well I find my mouse because I can't find it. Um, so a question from Zoe here asking about how much of a bilateral blood pressure difference in millimeters of mercury would you consider make you consider a dissection? So. I suppose I have touched a little bit of this in to say that I don't think it's if you if you if it's present, it's a good thing to suggest a dissection. Um, if it's not, it doesn't rule it out. So you're right that, yes, if you if you see it, uh, it might help you. I would say at least 20 uh, would be my my cutoff, but it's not a, a firm thing. You know, someone's got a difference of 60 or 70. It, it's a clearly a blood pressure differential there's no doubt about it but whether you're you know if you do it once it's 15 you repeat it it's 30 you repeat it it's three it's so variable it, it's got to be a reasonably large difference and persistent as well thanks Zoe. good question uh, Susie has asked are there any lifestyle factors to consider in the older patient group that may heighten suspicion of ad so in a word, no, really. I mean, atherosclerosis does predispose to it. So things that predispose to atherosclerosis, so smoking, high blood pressure, an example. But other than that, it's all the all of the um, things that precipitate acute atherosclerosis. But as I've said, you can get it in patients with connective tissue disease. So I wouldn't let that sway you. Fab, good question. Uh, we've also got another question here. When you say abrupt chest pain onset, is this over seconds or minutes? So over seconds, so building up quickly over the course of uh, seconds to a minute or so, similar to subarachnoid hemorrhage, sudden onset. Excellent. And are there any considerations for administration of medication in the pre-hospital environment if we suspect uh, AAS? So if you suspect it, you need to get the patient to hospital. And I think covering another question there, that should be an emergency department, not a specialist unit, because... Um, uh, people may be able to be transferred. If you have a choice to send them to the patient to somewhere where there is acute thyrothoracic unit, um, that might be the better option. But normally you want to go to your nearest ED because there are lots of other possibilities that the, the presentation could be. Um, but no, pre-hospitally, 
there isn't really anything pain relief keep the patient comfortable and get them to hospital excellent question from adam aside from the adrs oh that's just disappeared um is there anything pre-hospital providers can do to improve identification or interventions for these patients so again it's all on the history so sudden onset severe chest pain consider it and very importantly once you've consider it pass over and hand over that consideration to the emergency department team because they may not think of it um, and you may be the per the only person who's thought of it and you making sure that information is relayed that it's one of the differentials you're concerned about may be the thing that leads the hospital staff to consider it uh, another question what's your thoughts on txa uh, no evidence and i'm not aware of any trials it's uh, it's a no for any aortic disease Question from Richard, would permissive hypotension be a good idea in the pre-hospital environment? So no, um, uh, lowering of blood pressure may cause worse perfusion to end organs that are not being perfused properly. Um, so yeah, again, analgesia hospital. Excellent, good tip for you there. Analgesia and hospital pretty much sums up um, Dr. Matt, thank you so much indeed for tonight. What a fab look at that perfectly timed one within one minute. That is just like, boom, easy. <laughs> Remember, everybody, we will share the recording tomorrow. You'll also, if you are a member of CPDME, get your certificates. So once Fabio and Amy get in the office in the morning, uh, once they've fueled up with some coffee, they'll get your certificates out for you. Uh, please, I will stay online for another five minutes to answer any questions in the chat. So if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to um, either put in the Q&A or the chat and I will stay live online. But uh, on behalf of myself and all the team, uh, Professor Matt, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for the invitation. Lovely to meet you all. Take care. Thanks, Dr. Matt. As I said, thank you all of you for joining me tonight. If you are at home, then kick off your slippers. Enjoy the rest of your evening. I will stay online to answer Q&A for the next five minutes. But if you have got any questions, either message the team tonight or message them tomorrow, either via WhatsApp or via the website, and they will be all over it first thing in the morning. But on behalf of myself and all the team, thank you so much for your ongoing and continuing support. And take care and have an amazing evening. Thank you.